giving us an opportunity to come again to study God's word. It is God's word that we want to study. And today, this is not a continuation of Revelation because I can't do Revelation. And pastor is traveling. So we are, this is a one-off uh, Bible study. So we are going to learn about the New Testament church. You know, we have been studying about the book of Hebrews and the book of Acts. And now we are in Revelation. You know, it's good to study books, but it's also good to study a certain topic, right? And then you may ask me this question, why the church? Why did we study the church? It's important that we go back to the foundations of the church. You know, we gather together every Sunday and, uh, and, other, and, 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 every other, and, and during the weekdays, we gather together and we fellowship together, we study and we, we call ourselves the church, eternal life church. So why do we need to learn and study the word of God or study about the church. It's uh, important once in a while, let's go to back to the basics and understand what church is and all that. So this opportunity we never got because you know we had pastors speaking to us from the book of Revelation before that book of Hebrews and book of Acts. You know, we learned from the book of Acts before. And so we never had an opportunity to study a particular subject. And here is here is uh, an opportunity here. So we are going to have this study today and hopefully next week onwards, we'll start, we'll continue with the book of Revelation. So the New Testament church, you know, we grew up in different churches and we all come from different backgrounds. And I thought it would be a good idea to come together and see what the Bible talks about the church, correct? I mean, some people are from Orthodox, from Marthoma, from other churches. I do not know where I was a, Jacobite, I guess. And then uh, we joined the Pentecostal church, but a church, right? So it's all different kinds of church. And many people may have different understanding of the church. So I thought, well, let's go back to the basic and see what the Bible talks about the New Testament church. And so we are here to study about the New Testament church. So I'm going to cover these 10 points. Hopefully I should be able to cover it because those 10 points, um, you know, I've been I've been preparing since uh, last uh, Sunday, I guess, because pastor called us on either on a Friday or a Saturday and told us that he won't be this, he won't be there this weekend. Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, you guys have to take care of it. And so we are here to learn about the church. So I'm going to cover 10 points. You know, the church, what is the church? The visible and the invisible church, the foundation of the church, other names that refers to the church in the New Testament. Um, who builds a church? The mission of the church, the governing structure of the New Testament church, roles and responsibility of a church member, the enemies of the church, and the church glorified. Now, this is a vast subject, so much to cover, but I guess we have to, what, nine o'clock? Usually we stop at nine o'clock, right? Right? Uh, so let's, uh, let's see whether we can cover as much as we can. And towards the end, if possible, we'll open up, open it up for questions, okay? Question and answer. And I say, as a disclaimer, I have to put, I may not have answers for all your questions. Do not ask me all that hard questions. If you have a question, we'll refer it to pastor later on, or we collectively can try to answer the questions, okay? So I encourage people while we are learning these things, if you have a question, write it down. We can talk about it at towards the end, okay? If time permits. So. What is a church? What is a church? So the local church is a gathering of those who believe in Jesus Christ, right? We all know that some of the things we all know, some of the things might be new to us. So just bear with me the basic stuff that we all know. So church is a translation of the Greek term called ecclesia, okay? A Greek term, when you read the Greek Bible, you know, the New Testament, church in the, in the in the Greek is called ecclesia and it's used to identify the community of believers. So whenever believers come together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, they call it ecclesia in the Greek Bible. It literally means assembly or congregation or a meeting, meeting of believers. Now Jesus declares, uh, you know, in Matthew chapter 16, I believe, I will build my church it refers strictly to the congregation of believers in Jesus Christ. I will build my church, who said Jesus said. So in the New Testament, no building or structure like the Jewish synagogue or the, or the Greek temples or chapels as we call it today, the, the tabernacle and the building or other meeting places, no structure 
was ever called a church, but the term always referred to, to Christian assembly, people who are the followers of Jesus Christ. When they come together, they are called the church. So in the New Testament, it was, was used for both the local community of believers and the overall collection of Christians, you know, Christians from other churches all together. So we'll say, these are the church of God, okay? So in the first sense, for which this word church is used, uh, what we call the local local church, you know, it is defined by geographical, uh, geographical location, uh, like geographical settings. So the church in the New Testament, when we look at the New Testament, we, uh, we see how the churches are identified. They are identified by the name of the city, right? So, you know, never was the name given a country's name or a region's name, but it was always um, recognized or identified by the name of the city, like the city of the Church of Corinth or the Church of Ephesus, right? The Church of Thessalonica. You know, these are all churches because there used to be one city and there used to be one church. So people all gather together in that one central location to worship on the worship day. And so they called it the name of the city. The city's name was the church's name. But then later on, you know, some large geographical locations came uh, into being like the church in Galatia. You know, if you read the book of Galatians, uh, it, it gives an example that I, it says the churches in the city of Galatia. So it's a plural thing, right? The church, that means what? There could be multiple churches in the same location. The churches of Galatia means a plural, but Galatia is a larger region, a bigger region. So people could not travel to the central location. So they started churches in different location within the Galatian region. And so they, the, the, the Paul, when he writes to the, to the church in Galatia, he cites the churches of Galatia. That's how it, it, it says in, the, in, in Galatians chapter one. And the other sense of church means it refers to the universal church. Okay, universal means a collection of believers in Jesus Christ from all times and all places, okay? So the first universal church meeting, when do you think the first universal church meeting would happen? You know, when I say universal church are believers of all times and all places, can you guess when would be the first meeting of this church collectively happening? Anybody? I think, I think the first universal church meeting would happen on the day of rapture, right? I don't know how many people said that, but on the day of rapture, all the believers in Jesus Christ will be gathered together and that would be one grand meeting of the believers of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So we read in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the, with the, with the, with the voice of the archangels, and, uh, and with the trumpet sound of God, and all the dead in Christ will rise first. Correct? Then we who are still alive, you and me, if we are still alive, who are left, we will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet with the Lord. So all these people, the dead will rise and the alive people who are alive still all will be caught up in that great rapture. And that would be, I believe, would be the first gathering of the universal church of all believers. Now, remember, when the rapture happens, everybody who calls upon the name of the Lord or everybody who attends church service Everybody who claims to be Christian may not get raptured. It would be a surprise for many people, right? So we got to live a life that is pleasing to God according to his will to be caught up in that rapture. Okay, so we learned about the church. So now let's go to the next one, the visible and the invisible church. I know you guys have heard this terms before, but because we are learning about the church, it's important that we cover these basic things because we have children sitting with us, young adults, everybody sitting. Some people might have heard it. Some people may not have heard it. So it's good to clarify these things as we go along because tomorrow pastor will come and ask you, hey, what did Jason brother teach? And he will say, he taught us about church. Okay, tell me what is the difference between visible and invisible? And you will say, I, we never heard about it. <laughs> the pastor will ask, what did you teach the people? So visible and invisible church. Okay. 
So all people who are members of the local church are considered to be part of the visible church, okay? Now, what do we mean when we make the distinction between the visible and the invisible church? And what is, what is the reason for this distinction, okay? So the, the expression visible church was referred by theologians. Uh, it was not referred for a building. You know, we, uh, you know, people think that church means a huge building with a cross at the top. And there are people who think that way. You know, Crystal's friend came to our, our church a couple of years ago, and she was very disappointed when she came to the ELC classroom and said, we said, this is our church. Because she thought a, ELC, a, a church would be a grand structure with a big, uh, you know, nice uh, pulpit and all that stuff. But she was disappointed. She said, is this what church, church is? Is this how a church is? You know, so she was disappointed. But again, I had to explain uh, what the real church means over there. Because people have different ideas of the church. So the expression, visible church is not again talking about building, but it is talking about people. All people who are members of a local church are considered to be part of the visible church. So you and I, we all can see each other with our, our physical eye, and these are members. So this is the visible church that we can see. On the other hand, the invisible church refers to those persons who have actually been regenerated or quickened by the Holy Spirit. God's elect or true believers, as we call it. Now, you may say that everybody in the invisible church is also the same people. No. So the local church, which is a visible church, is a mixed body of people, which has both people who are regenerated people and unregenerated people. Now, only God knows who is regenerated and who is unregenerated. Okay? But the, from, from the history of the church, we see a church consists of people who are saved, and who think they are saved. Remember in Matthew chapter 25, we read about the 10 virgins, correct? We read about the 10 virgins. The 10 virgins were members of the church. They were all waiting for the Lord Jesus to come, right? For the bridegroom to come. But five made it, five did not make it. All members of the church, they worshiped together. They were all prepared. They knew about the Lord. They have done many things in the name of the Lord but only five made it inside and the other five did not make it. And what happened when those five people, five virgins came and knocked at the door? The voice from inside came saying what? I never knew you. I never knew you. Why? They did not make it inside into the kingdom of God because they were not truly saved. They were not regenerated, but they were members of the church. They regularly went and worshiped. Okay. So that is, that is what, the visible church. Visible church is a mixed body of people, both regenerate and, and not ungenerated people. So we are called to make a distinction between who is who. So we are not called. I and you cannot tell who it is, but God can say, right? When we say the, 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 the visible church is us, but the invisible church is through the lens of God, okay? Through the lens of God, when God looks at the church, he knows who belongs to him. He knows who belongs to him, who are truly regenerated. You know, there's a time of separation coming. You know, we read about uh, the, the analogy, the tares and the wheat, as described by Jesus. There are wheats and there's wheat, okay? There are uh, uh, weeds among the wheat. So there will be a time of separation coming, like the goats and the sheep are going to be separated. A time of separation will come and only God knows the real visible, uh, invisible churches because from God's lens, he knows truly who are born again. From our lens, from our physical eye, we cannot tell that. So in other words, there is no such thing as a perfect church. You will never find a perfect church because why? There will be always people in the church with bad motives or there will be wrong reasons or there may be people who are really not regenerated. They may be, they may be born in the church. They may be raised up in the church but their hearts are not truly devoted, dedicated to God. People go to church because they've been, they've, they've, they've been going to church on Sundays, every Sunday. And so though habitually they go to church and they sit over there, but they have no joy of the Lord in their life. They do not really worship. But since they have practiced doing this from a very childhood, they come to church. And that's why 
you know, it's very important that we, 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 we speak the word of God, we share the gospel so the people may truly regenerate. Some, some persons in the church are for sure, they come for sure. Many people come for sure. They, some people come for business needs. Some people come for socialization. Many people have many reasons to come to the church, but the true regenerate people are the God's real invisible church. All right, so that's clear. Let's move on. The foundation of the church now, okay. Now, when we talk about foundation, you know, Ephesians chapter two, verse 19 and 22 says, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophet with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you, you two are being built together to, becoming, to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and 22. So Paul says the foundation of the church is made up of prophets and apostles. That is the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles. Okay, in the New Testament, we have apostles. Why? Why is that? It is because the prophet and the apostles are the agents of revelation by whom God speaks to his people. So in the old times, the prophets used to uh, speak the word of God. The Bible says all the time in the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, right? And the prophet would come and speak the word of God and say, thus saith the Lord. And they would speak to the people of Israel. And the New Testament, we have apostles. And God, Lord Jesus Christ, reveals everything to his apostles. And the apostles becomes an agent who, who, who brings God's revelation to us. So the foundation away in this verse says the foundation is built on the apostles and the prophet. Now, what does it mean? So he describes the foundation of this temple as a foundation of apostles and prophets and Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And other parts of the Bible, like 1 Peter and in 2 and in Psalms also, we read Psalms 118, where we see Jesus also called the chief cornerstone. Okay, so a church foundation it's built upon the teachings of the apostles and the prophets, but the chief cornerstone is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That was a, that's what the Bible says. Okay, so there can be no other foundation but one foundation stone, which is Jesus Christ. Okay, so the foundation of the church is Jesus Christ. It says in First Corinthians chapter three verse eleven, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid which is Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone, okay? And that's, that's the foundation. That's the foundation that we build our faith. So there, there are other passages that makes clear that Jesus himself is the foundation. The chief cornerstone was a foundation stone. Look, in the ancient time, you know, when architects come and, and uh, build a building or something, you know, a structure, they will start with one big stone, okay? And that becomes the cornerstone and from which uh, other stones will be attached and the structure will be created, okay? So Jesus Christ is the foundation. In that sense, the foundation is not just the apostles and prophets, but Jesus Christ himself. Apostles and prophets got everything from the Lord Jesus Christ and they were just communicators, okay? But, you know, there are some people who claim that this, by looking at this verse, some, some claim this means that the apostles and prophets are the foundation. But such a view is a wrong interpretation of the scripture. Apostles and prophets are not the foundation of the church. It does not say that the apostles and prophets are the foundation, but they revealed the gospel message to the world about Jesus, who is the foundation of the church and how people can become members of that church. You know? So apostles and prophets, they are mere ambassadors or messengers of the Lord Jesus. Right now, as people are converted, they are added to the church, right? They are added to the church and built to the foundation, like a brick are added to the building, and we build a brick one above the other. The whole building is gradually built up and joined together to serve the spiritual temple in which God Himself dwells. Correct? 
So a church is nothing but Jesus Christ as the foundation and all brothers and sisters are joined together to this cornerstone and we build the church up. So again, church is never a building. It is a group of dedicated, committed, covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Those collective people come together, makes the church and Jesus Christ is a foundation that they have. All right, uh, any questions so far? I guess, no? All right, let's move on. Okay, now we call it church. But church, when you look at, when you read the New Testament, there are many, many uh, other names given to a church or referred to, church is referred to as different things. In Ephesians chapter one, verse 22, we read has, has the church as a body of Christ, right? Revelation 21, nine says, uh, there are, there, there came up, uh, there, you know, it talks about the bride of Christ, you know, it talks about the bride of Christ. And uh, Acts 20, 28, Church of God. Now, these names are given, Church of the Living God, Church of the Firstborn. You know, when we have children, right? And uh, we, we love our children, so we give them nicknames. We call them by different names, right? Or, or you know, we call them different beautiful names that we like. You know, we call them Chakare, we call them, uh, you know, Honey, Beauty, and all that stuff, right? We call them different names. We don't sometimes call them by their name. We call them different names. So God also calls his beloved church by different names. Okay. You know, it says over here in second, uh, first Peter chapter two, nine, you are the chosen people, the royal priesthood and a holy nation referring to the church, right? All these names, house of Christ, house of God, Israel of God, the vineyard, right? He calls you vineyard and talks to the church as, hey, this is the vineyard of God, the house of God. And all these different names are referred in the church. It's all nothing but a group of believers coming together in worship of the Lord Savior, Jesus Christ. And they are committed believers, okay? They're all committed. they all saved people by grace. God has called them effectually and they come to worship God. And these are the different names that we see in the Bible about the church. All right, let's continue. Okay, so now the question is, who builds a church, right? We know Jesus Christ is the foundation and uh, who builds a church, right? So Jesus declared that he would build his church personally. Which verse is that? Which verse is that? Which says, it says Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 says what? I will build my church. Who said that? Jesus said, I will build my church. And that does not mean that uh, he does not use other people. You know, Jesus said he's going to build a church, so I'm just going to sit quietly and the church will just grow. Like people will jump into the church, automatically gets converted. I have nothing to do now. It's that, that's not the case. You know, it means that God is going to use others for the task of building the church. But the inspiration comes from the Holy Spirit. You know, in Acts chapter 2, we read the birth of the church, correct? We read the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. We read the birth of the church. People were timid. They were scared. They were worried. They thought they were going to be get persecuted. But what happened? They obeyed the Lord Jesus and they were in the upper room sitting over there. And then the Holy Spirit came and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. The power of God came upon them. And what happened that day? Peter, who was a timid person, who denied Jesus three times, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, God gave him the wisdom to speak. He stood up and spoke very powerfully to people. And what happened that day? That day, 3,000 people joined the church. What happened? Jesus is building the church, but he is equipping the people so that they may be able to speak. And if you look at it carefully, Jesus was there, Peter was there. But what was not there at that time, before, before people, Jesus' ascension into heaven? The Holy Spirit wasn't there. So Jesus said, wait until I send you the comforter, and the comforter will come and empower you. And they waited, and in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, they were all waiting. And there comes the comforter, and the Holy Spirit 
empowered. So Holy Spirit is required for us to go and share the gospel message. It is not my strength. It is not my wisdom. It is nothing that we do. It is God working in and through us to build the church. Peter stood up there by the aid, by the unction of the Holy Spirit. And he spoke the word of God so powerfully that 3,000 people joined the church. Okay. And towards the end of Acts chapter 2, if you read, God continuously added people into the church. You see that verse over there. In the last verse of, I think, uh, Acts chapter 2, God continuously added and the church kept on growing. Why? Who is building the church? It is Jesus Christ who is building. But he will use you and me. Every local church is comprised of diverse group of people who have been radically transformed by the power of God through the person and work of Jesus Christ. These diverse people have no reason to live and work together. You know, people from, from the black community, the white community, the, the Hispanic, the everybody, when you go to church, you'll find different kinds of diverse people. But there's one thing that is common in them. You know, they may have be a different background. They may be from different communities. They may grew, grew up in a different culture. But one thing is very common. If they are born of God, they have their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ has their Savior. There'll be great love between them. There'll be a great love fest. If I know that a brother who works with me is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, there'll be a separate, there'll be a special attraction towards him. Because why? We serve the same God. So that is what happens when God saves his people. Now, uh, as I said, God, the Lord Jesus Christ built the churches, but he also uses people. Who does he use people? You know, he uses you and me to build a church. You know, uh, a pastor by the name, the name uh, I can't pronounce his name, but he's a pastor from First Baptist Church uh, of Zambia. He came up with a list of six people who, who, who are from the church that God uses to build the church. Now, you can put yourself in one of these groups, okay? So the members who attend, the members who attend the church. So attending the church service is most basic way members build each other, right? Now, we have been going through Zoom meetings for a while now, but Lord willing, you know, we plan to gather again in a church hall uh, in, the, in, the, in the near future. And things are being worked out in that, in that direction. So attending the church service is one of the most basic fundamental way where people come together and we can build each other, right? It is the most obvious way to show commitment to the body, you know, commitment to the body. How are you committed to the church? By attending the services. Now, many people think that, hey, it is not necessary to attend church service. Some people think, hey, I can only attend church service on a Sunday. Rest of the day, week, week programs, I don't really have to attend. See, that is not right. You know, see, there is, there is encouragement coming from brothers and sisters when we come together in a church service. And we are coming together with one accord for one purpose, to worship the triune God. Correct? So when we come with that attitude, that itself connects us together because we have one purpose. Our purpose is to, is to worship our Redeemer. And we are all redeemed people of God because, hey, that is a time we can all come together, right? And, and, and because one day we got to live in heaven together. And so it's a very joyous occasion. I, and I really want this pandemic to get over. I really want us to come to church. I really want to have an interaction with my brothers. You know, it's it's very joyful occasion. Sitting at home and looking through Zoom, I can it's okay, kind of a little nice thing. But, you know, we really miss. I really enjoy last Sunday's worship. I hope everybody enjoyed it. It was a good time that we had. I was talking to pastor after that and he said, oh man, he started very nicely, very quietly, very carefully. But when he saw the response from the church, oh, he was so joyful and he just went on. You know, you saw that? He just started preaching the word of God. See, that's the encouragement you get, but you don't get that in a Zoom meeting. You know, I know I want to hear your voices, but we can all mute ourselves. And I can't hear any praise the Lord, hallelujah. So I'm, I'm working very hard over here to, to bring this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this Bible study to you. But if the church responds in a very joyful and a positive way, there's a special joy comes, a special energy comes, 
and faster was all went all out that day. You know, I never saw pastor like that. I mean, he, he was so encouraged. So, you know, attending church service, coming together, saying a hallelujah, praise the Lord, when pastor is preaching or somebody is preaching, it's always an encouragement. What are you doing? You're building the body of Christ. Jesus Christ is the head and we are all the members of the body. And you and I, we encourage each other by saying, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Attending Zoom meetings, some of us are missing. I don't know, I think there are some people missing in our, our Friday meeting because they know that Jason is going to speak, man, going to be boring. So let's, not, let's just skip it this time, right? I don't know, maybe they have some genuine reasons too. So praise the Lord, we could gather together and that is an encouragement, right, George? That is an encouragement for you to see me, see me to see you. And Sumanth is there and Geetu is there and everybody else is there. It's a joyful occasion. We spend time. We could have done something else, but we come together. Why? Because we come in the name of the Lord. We are building each other. If we don't build each other, then we slowly lose our power. We lose our power. Okay, let's continue because I have so much to cover. All right, so the members who attend church are building the church, okay? The second point is the members who encourage, encourage okay? So consider Paul's word to, to, to in the book of Colossians chapter four, you can see there's a guy named Tychicus, okay? Uh, he says in Colossians chapter four, I have sent him, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are that he may encourage your hearts, okay? Why does he send, this, send, why did Paul send his friend? To encourage the Colossians, okay? We should follow Paul's model. If God, if the apostle Paul encouraged people, he could not go, so he sent a friend of his, hey, go to the church of Colossians and speak about the things that we're doing over here and encourage them, encourage them so that if they're a little lukewarm, they, they, they fan into flame again and they encourage. So we should do what Paul, Paul did, right? We should follow Paul's model. The encouraging member appreciates. He will be thankful. He will comfort people. He will encourage, urge, support, compliment other members for what they do. You know, we often think of encouraging as merely giving praise, but you know, like a spectator's cheering from the side now. However, biblical encouragement is more than that. It is a fellow teammate urging you to get to work. See, everybody are servants, everybody is serving. I know I, I remember, you know, my heart goes out to this George family when they work very hard on that retreat time, you know, they would love to be there and listen to the messages, but George is cooking his food because his joy is coming when people eat the food and say, wow, it is fantastic, man. And that's where joy gets, George gets us joy. But praise the Lord for Brother George and his wife and that family, entire family. And so is everyone. Look at Sumanth and Gidu. You know, they are hardworking people over there, you know, and they are attending the Zoom meeting. And so is the Josen family. And uh, Sam, you are just going to taste all these things that are coming along. Come along and you will, you will enjoy the membership of this church, you know. So I praise God for all these members. Everybody is hardworking people in our church. And nobody get recognized, you know. Nobody get recognized. You know, people work very hard behind the hood. Look at Joseph's brother. You know, the, the amount of pressure that he takes upon himself. You know, and people sometimes say some things, this and that and all that, but has a church, church, church elder, he has taken so much abuse over the years, but still continues because Christ's love is what motivates him. You know, people may say a few things here and there to discourage, but there are other people who come together and encourage, you know, and so the church grows. So those people who appreciate, who, who comes and says some good things, even if, you know, our children, when they were standing over there for the for their testimony <laughs> on last Sunday church. And, uh, and one of our child was, uh, was not able to say, you know, how, how the black community over there, how they responded, hey baby, you can do it. You can do it, you can do it. So that's encouragement, right? You know, it was encouraging for all of us. So praise God, you know, for people who encourages the church members. You know, when people work hard, you got to recognize from them from behind and say, you know, brother, I, my heart really goes out for you. And thank you very much for being that pillar in the church. You know, all of us are pillars in the church. Everybody plays a little role, you know, because we all are members of God's church and you all have to play a role. So the members who encourage, the members who comforts, or conference actually, 
conference without indulging gossip. Now, let me tell, ask you this. You know, a church are full of sinful people. We are redeemed people of God, right? But we are still have that, that nature of sin within us, you know, which means members, you know, members may sin against each other. Uh, this 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 often poses a, a big challenge in the church. You know, there'll, there'll be church problems because there is there are things that are happening in the church that should not happen. And then the gossiping happens, right? Slandering happens. So these are not good things in the church. And the church and the, and the Bible prohibits any brother or sister to speak against another person in the behind their back. That's called gossiping. Okay. So there's a charge in you know, the scripture. You know, they, we, we are called to confront, you know, people who sin so that we can restore them back, you know, restore them back into, into Christian living or restore them back out of their sinful way of living and then motivate the brother. So when you find somebody who is not living a right life, you know, or, or doing something that's not right, it is important that in brotherly love, we confront that brother so that the brother may come to know the sin that he's committing and that he may turn away from his sin and come back to the church. You know, that is one way to build the church. If somebody is sinning and somebody's uh, not doing what they're supposed to do, somebody is a lukewarm Christian, it's important that we encourage him, we, we help that brother up. So it's very important that we encourage we, when we see sin in the church, we confront that, but don't, but don't go into gossiping. That is against God. God sees it. All right. The fourth group of people are the people who pray. Praise the Lord for people who pray. We have prayer warriors among us. You know, and I and my heart melts when I see some people pray in the church. I can tell that the prayer is coming from the bottom of their heart. You know, so praise God for people who pray. You know, so there are there are people who pray. I, I want to go a little more faster because otherwise I'll not be able to cover everything. Then there are people who serves, right? Everybody serves. Now, some people serve more, some people serve less, but we want to encourage everybody to be of service. Do whatever you can. Do whatever you can. You know, one day I was seeing a young boy in our church. I don't want to name him. There's a young guy in our church, a young boy in our church, who's always out there to serve. If you have noticed, when every kid is running around doing something, this kid will be going and picking up chairs and putting it away. This kid will be going and putting other, you know, he's working. He's looking at his dad, learning from his dad, and he's working. Praise God for those children who has a heart of service. And again, these things come from the family. You know, we try to teach them, but it has to come from the father and the mother. So all members have to see how can I serve the church? How can I build the church? Is there anything that I can use my talent, my knowledge? How can I be a person who can serve and help the church? You know, many times, you know, I hear 80% of the church does nothing and 20% of the people does everything. That should not be the case of eternal life church. We all come together, we all work together, and we all produce, you know, a good labor for the Lord. You know, our reward is in heaven. And uh, the sixth people, the members who show patience, you know, we got to have patience. There are some people who are very patient. I'm not a very patient guy. I get really very upset sometimes. But patient is a very vital, important, vitally important for everybody, in every individual believer and the congregation as a whole. We have to be patient. After all, Christ's life isn't a, you know, you know with Jesus Christ, you know, a Christian life, let's say a Christian life, it's not a sprint. You don't just sprint it over. It's a marathon. You run slowly, you run slowly. By the way, tomorrow I'm going to run my first half marathon, 13 miles. We'll find out whether I'm able to do it. I've been practicing it for the last two, three months now, but tomorrow I'm going to run 13 miles. But it took a lot of time. I could not run one mile. I could not run two miles. Leg was hurting. But over the period of time, after a lot of training, uh, we'll be trying to do a, a half marathon to, tomorrow. So that's how Christian life is also. When you are born again, when you're a new believer, you are at the very first step. And it takes a whole lot of time. It takes a lifelong, uh, the entire generation to become Christ. And so you know, you know, over the period of time, we learn patience. So there are people who need to be patient because we'll see things that are not right. And we may get upset, but God teaches us patience. So dear church members, pursue these qualities in your own life. 
you know, pursue these qualities in your own life and encourage each other. Okay, encourage you to be a, a serving person, a praying person, you know, show encouragement to other people, do not gossip behind other people. And more importantly, attend every service that you can. We are a small group of people. If I don't see one family, you know, in the group, we think what happened. And if the family, we find out the family is going to do something that's not very important, it, it breaks my heart. I'd say, what happened to this family? Why did they find it important to go for a certain thing that's less than, why didn't they gather to the, to, to the church? It's important. If it's important, then you have to go, but do not, do not forsake gathering together because it is always a blessing. You know, the verse comes into my mind. The Bible says in, in, I think in Psalms, I was glad when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so how many of us are really looking for a Sunday worship? How many of us are really looking for a Friday Bible study or a, or a, Wednesday or a, or a, or a, or a fasting prayer? You know, these are things that we have to look forward for. All right, let's continue. The mission of the church. Wow. The mission of the church. Okay, so the time is 825. I'll try to go a little more faster. All right. So Jesus calls out, you know, the, 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 question ask, the question to ask, the obvious question to ask is, hey, what is the mission of your church? The mission of the church is nothing but the great commission that, that the Lord Jesus has given the people. And what is the great commission, right? We read in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, right? Jesus called the church to make disciples, followers of Jesus, right? He provided us the great commission to his followers and he prepared uh, you know, he has prepared a heaven for all his believers, all his followers. And he sends us the Holy Spirit and to start the church. So the church starts with the aid of the Holy Spirit. What did he say in that word? He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore, go therefore. It is a command given to all believers. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you. See, that's God's promise. I am with you. What have we to do? We have to go and find people who are not in Christ, share the gospel message, and when they are converted by the aid of the Holy Spirit, the first step of obedience is baptism. And once they are baptized, it is not the end. It is just the beginning a lifelong time of discipleship. When a person is born again, the first step of obedience is being baptized and then he comes into discipleship. No man should be outside discipleship. Everyone should be a disciple. And this disciple, God has put mentors and elders and leaders and pastors so that we may learn. A disciple, see, I, I often uh, think about, you know, Gehazi. Now, there's a man named Gehazi. I think it was Elisha or one Elijah. I get confused which one. Gehazi was a man who wanted to become rich. And so he ran away to get from Naaman some type of a money for, for getting cleansed. And uh, I think it was Elisha who said, where were you? Now, Gehazi is a disciple. And the master wanted to know where he was. Okay. He was, where he was, see, a master or a, a discipler who's discip discipling another person should know where this person is going. He had the power, he had the authority to ask, where did you go? Where did you go? Well, he said, I was over here. He was, but God revealed to him what happened. So a person who comes in the discipleship, when you are not in a church one Sunday or on a, on a service that's supposed to be there, you got to tell your pastor or the elder or somebody that, hey, I will not be here because I'm going on a sort of trip. Something should happen. That has to happen. Or the pastor can ask, where have you been? Where have you been? He has the authority to ask because we are all disciples of Jesus Christ coming under, under the authority of pastors and the elders. Okay. So what was I telling? The mission of the church is to, okay, here. So God has given us this great commission, but the ultimate purpose of this great commission is to glorify God, okay? So the church mission is to glorify God by proclaiming the gospel to the lost, right? You know that, right? You know that. 
the church's commission again the mission of the church is to glorify god by making christ like disciples who love god and one another see if we are a child of god if we are a disciple of god we got to have a first a vertical relationship with our god right if you do not have a vertical relation me and my christ me and my savior that relationship has to be established first if that is established and then we got to have this horizontal relationship that means i and god's people this is what church is all about first you have a relationship with your savior and then you have relationship with your brothers and sisters in the lord and that is the mission of the church to 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 make people like christ disciple them so that they may love god and they may love one another and the other mission of the church is to glorify god by making christ like disciples who make christ like disciples so when you have been called and you have been saved and there is a purpose behind it that you may go and share the good news of the lord jesus christ to other people and that you may be saved correct so we start sharing the gospel message to other people they hear it and they will be saved right so this is the commission the great mission the commission the mission of the church this has to be the mission the gospel message is what saves people you know the you know, many people come up with many different kinds of strategies but they never share the gospel message everything else is done but there is no gospel the bible says the word says the message of the gospel how is the word uh the message of the gospel uh it's not coming the verse is not coming anybody who can recite their verse uh who can recite their verse um uh, i can't I, it's not coming sometimes it just comes in sometimes it doesn't come um okay the message of the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us who are being saved it is the power of god correct the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing you share the gospel message it is foolishness to those who are perishing but to us you and me it is the power of god for those who are being saved see pastor talked about you are saved you are being saved and you are you will be saved that means you'll be glorified and we are still being saved and the gospel still has has value it's still it's not that some people think that gospel message is only preached when a person has to be converted and be a, to 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 receive jesus christ after that gospel message is not required i'm saying every message that we hear from the pulpit has to be the gospel message or it has to relate to the gospel message because that is gives us power it is the power of god unto salvation all right so let's continue all right new testament church structure we are talking about the church so church should have a structure and we know that jesus christ is the head he is the cornerstone he is the foundation stone he is the one who saves people okay now everybody under jesus christ saved by grace are called the saints of god you know that we all are saints of god but every saint now this picture i got from the internet uh i don't 100% agree with it but i still agree with it okay that's why i put it over there so all the saints of god but there are people given certain responsibilities right in the in the new testament term we have apostles we have evangelists we have prophets we have overseers and some of the overseers are pastors the elders shepherds of the church you know saints uh, deacons are there you know the administrators and there are many people in also but they all saints of god and god gives them special power okay special talents special uh, a uh, grace to do certain things you know certain things uh some people may have a a a grace to to organize stuff some people have grace for hospitality some people know how to pray before god they will dedicate their whole day to pray and they will joyfully take people's burden and pray some people have been given the gift of sharing the message some people may not have the ability to stand in a pulpit and share the message but if you stick that person with another person oh he will share the gospel message one to one okay that's another talent but he may not be able to stand in a pulpit and give the message but if you give him a person he's 
friendly with the person, he will share the gospel message. And some people have been given the talent to stand on the pulpit and speak, preach hours and hours, you know, God gives them grace to preach. So there are many, many different kinds of talents and God gives that. And these are all different ways that God builds up the church. So this is a New Testament church structure. You will never see secretary over here. There will not be treasurers over here. And this is all appointed by Christ, okay? All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Okay. Now, roles and responsibility of a church member. Okay. So we're talking about church, right? Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We are all members of the church. But the church doesn't run. It's by itself. Christ empowers, gives grace, fills us with the Holy Spirit, and the church grows. God brings many people to church, and God uses many people to share the gospel message, and the church grows. But once they come to the church, there are responsibilities, right, for a church member. Do you think the responsibility? If I become a church member, I don't want to be just sitting over there in a pew and listening and walking away after the Sunday service. And in mega churches, that's what happened. Many, many churches, people are lost. And praise God for small churches. I love small church. You know, I was lost in that big church that I used to go. But I'm so thankful that God brought me to Eternal Life Church and you guys accepted me as your brother in the Lord and made me a church member. Praise God for that. So there are roles and responsibilities for church members. Okay. First of all, we have to assemble together, right? If church members don't assemble, then there is no church, correct? If everybody decides to do whatever they feel like, then there is no really a church. I'll tell you in Sacramento region, there are many pastors who do not have church. They were ordained at one point. There are so many pastors who do not have churches. Okay, they, they had church at some point, but that was all man-made stuff. So it grew and it came and then it just died. So, you know, people don't assemble. So if church members don't assemble, then we do not have a church. So in other words, gathering together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is part of part that makes a church a church, correct? If you all decide to go away, then I will be standing over here and who are sitting over here and speaking to who? nobody. So we all come together. So the author of Hebrews commanded in chapter 10, commanded that his readers not to forsake assembly together. Every church, okay, every church member should prioritize the Lord's day's worship with the people of God. So when you know Sunday there's a worship or Friday there's a Bible study or there's a, there's a service, there's a fasting prayer, try to put Try to work around it. Put all your other preferences around it so that everybody comes. There are some times when there's only two families in the church. We have a big program, and only two families shows up, which is very disheartening. But everybody comes together. It is a joy, right? All right. So, uh, so assembling together, then protecting the gospel. This is a major important thing. Do you know that we got to be we got to know the gospel and we have to be make sure the gospel is protected. Why? There are many people out there trying to distort the gospel. You know, even in the New Testament time, early New Testament time, there were different people who came out with different things. You know, apostles, you know, Paul wrote in the church of Galatia, he wrote, he writes this, and he, he chastised people. He chastised the people, the, and not the church, the entire church, for, for turning to a different gospel, okay? He held, he held the entire church accountable for the error because there are things that are creeping into the church, you know? Salvation is by grace alone. From beginning till the end, it is by grace alone. But many people come up with many other things, salvation by grace plus works, which is wrong because they think that to attain salvation, you got to, you got to do something about it. No. Salvation is by grace alone, okay? So there are, you know, there are, there are people who come up with wrong gospel, wrong teaching, and we are the protectors of that gospel. If anybody comes and preaches a different gospel, the Bible says, may he be accursed. May he be accursed, right? We cannot let other people come and use our pulpit or when we hear somebody else speaking a false gospel, we have to be smart enough. We have to be, Knowledgeable, knowledgeable enough to find out this gospel is the wrong gospel and then confront that person at that time. You know, there's a book written by a person called, I think, Rob Wells. 
It says your best life here, your best life over here. And there are so many other books written about the Gaston Major, which is distorted. People should not read it. But, you know, people come up with different and may, mega churches, you know, they distort the gospel a little bit. And then, and then you know, it's, it's a different gospel. That gospel doesn't change. There's only one gospel, the goodness of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. All right. Third, the role and responsibility of a church member. Third responsibility is to define your church membership. You know, church members are responsible to receive and dismiss members. See, Jesus instructed the church to regard an unrepentant brother as a Gentile. You remember that? Jesus said, if a brother comes and he sins, you go and tell him his sin and try to bring him back. But if he continues in his sin, you got to dismiss him from your community. It's a hard thing to do. Many churches don't do this. Many churches hide their face, let them do what they want. We don't want to interfere because that's a hard thing to do. But that's not what it says. We got to protect the church from the devil, from sin creeping in. Then the fourth one is to love one another. If I have a need, my brothers will come loving me, helping me out. If I find my brother or my sister in need, we got to go help. So roles and responsibility, one of the responsibilities is that we got to love one another. Sacrificial love. It's not like I do everything that's everything is okay with me. And if I can spare five minutes, then I may go and help my brother. No, it's not that way. If I see my brother in my need, I put everything, I sacrifice my entire day. Many important things I sacrifice and I go and help my brother. So that is sacrificial love. That's the love that you need to show. And one of the things that we have in the New Testament church, the fifth one, is to submit to the elders. Pastors are God's gift to us. And we as members of the church are supposed to submit to the elders. See, this is the occasion when we get to learn about the church. You know, nobody speaks about all these things. But now we, know we have a chance. I'm bringing this to you. So submitting to the elders. Hebrews chapter 13 talks about it. You know, exhorts every Christian brothers or sisters and sisters to obey their leaders and to submit to them, all right? And when a pastor speaks about that, people may say, oh, man, he's trying to rule over us. No, but that's the word of God. Elders are a gift for the church from Christ. Now, they are men, according to the Bible, they are men of characters gifted to teaching and applying the scriptures. Praise God for people who bring the scriptures to you and applies these things. You know, church members are responsible to obey Jesus Christ and submit to the elders of the church. And then that's how we grow in grace. Church members should not follow the elders blindly. You know, there are people who will say, hey, don't live the way I live, but just do what I do. And that not, person is not qualified to be an elder. You know, a person has to be an example in his own family, and then he has to be an example to the church, then only he can be an elder. So these are the five things that I want to bring to you about, about, uh, about uh, there's one more thing, the evangelizing, the evangelizing the lost, okay? So as church members, we have to go out and evangelize the lost. Okay, let's move on. So now, church has enemies. Do you believe that? The church have enemies? Yes, the church has enemies. You know, false teaching. False teaching comes to the church. See, when a smart and eloquent person comes, uh, when he speaks a message on the pulpit, we have to be very careful to what we are hearing. We don't want to hear positive thinking. We don't want to hear psychology. We want to hear the word preached, okay? Many people will come with very nice stories and all that. Look at the, what is the substance that he's bringing in? You know, there are false teachers who come and, and cause a lot of problems in the church. They come with a different gospel different teaching and they are led by the devil. The devil, the devil is a roaring beast walking around us seeking how he can devour people. And, uh, and people may think, people... Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So, enemies of the church. See, the enemy doesn't want me to talk about this, see? <laughs> see the devil, devil knows this is the time to attack. 
and they are trying to attack, even though it's my mom who's calling me, I should not say that. But this is the time she calls. She never calls me in the evening, but this is the time she chose to call. And she might call again and again. So I don't know. I may have to just uh, mute everything. Anyway, praise the Lord. There again comes. There again comes. Oh, Lord. See, the enemy doesn't want us to talk about the enemy because we make people aware of the enemy and the enemy is trying to steal away the attention. So the enemy comes. You know, we may think the enemy may come from outside, but the enemy is inside the church, okay? False teaching, they come, they walk, and they speak about falsehood, and that's what happens. You know, people may get lured by false teaching, and they may go against wrong teaching, and they may, they may follow false preachers and all that. You know, the second enemy is the worldliness, right? The believers are not of the world because they belong to their Savior, Jesus Christ. See, unsaved people are, the, are of the world because they belong to the devil. The devil wants to draw believers away from, from our Savior and draw them close. So the, the unbelievers will not have the pressure of, of temptation because they already corrupt, they already are continuing. But the moment you become a child of God and say, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, that moment, temptation will start. Temptation will start. Temptation will start. And you will, be, you will be fighting this temptation all your Christian life. But God gives us the aid of the Holy Spirit. So worldliness is there. Last time in a men's, men's um, uh, ministry when we're having, I think uh, Cedric asked this question, is temptation coming from the devil? And at that time I was thinking... Temptation comes from three sources. One is the devil. Yes, of course, he tempts. Second, the world. And third, it is our own flesh. We live in a corrupt body. Our flesh craves for sin. You know, until God comes and transforms us, you know, we sin, live in a sinful body. So yes, there is sin coming out from us, from our, uh, our body itself. Third enemy is something called legalism, Okay. Legalism. What is legalism? Okay, legalism is a special kind of false teaching. Okay, in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, we'll see legalism creeping into the church. And certain men which came down with, uh, with the Judean brothers, they started teaching wrong teachings. Like, hey, you got to be circumcised if you want to be in the church. You know, so they become lawful people. They bring the law and they say, if you are truly a member of the church, you got to be circumcised. Otherwise, you will not be a member. See, that legalism is very dangerous because it gets a person to look away from Christ and his cross. And he thinks that he needs to do something more to attain his salvation. He has to do something by himself to attain salvation. No. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, which is mentioned in the scriptures alone. And all these things happen for the glory of God alone. Solo Dio Gloria. Hallelujah. So salvation is by God and by God alone. Sanctification is a process where you and Christ work together. God works in you and you work out that salvation. Praise be to God. But God has to work in you first. So salvation from beginning till the end. I say it is the work of God. Okay. The fourth enemy is something called the formalism. Let's see what it is. Formalism is something that, that has outward form. It, okay, it has an outward form, but has no content inside. In, inwardly, they are kokala. Inwardly, they are hollow. There's nothing inside, but outside, they are very smart looking. They can talk nice. You know, it's just a form outside. Like, let's take a peanut, right? When you look at a peanut, the peanut looks very good. But if you open it, there's no nut in it. There's no peanut inside it. It's just a shell. What is the use of that peanut, right? If I break open a peanut and there's no peanut in it, absolutely useless, right? So it's, so some Christians are like form. They, yeah, they, they have a form, but within that, there is nothing in it. You know, it's like, no, it has it's like the important stuff is missing. You open a peanut and you don't see the nut inside. What is the use of the peanut? <laughs> what other examples can I give? You know. So anyway, so some Christians are just a form. They have nothing in it. They grew up in a church. They are doing everything 
emotional, you know, all those things. The next enemy of the church. Now, this is all within, okay? I'm not talking about church outside. This is all within. Emotional. There are emotional people, right? You have a lot of emotional people around. They do little thing and they go ballistic. You know, emotional is a problem and people are led by feelings and emotion. Why am I saved? Because one day I was sitting and worshiping God or the music was so good that I felt like worshiping God. And that's what I am a Christian for. But the next Sunday they come, the music is not there. It is not a, there's no band, there's no guitar. And they were, so they are, it is feeling based, you know. See, Christians cannot be feeling based. They have to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, most people are led and controlled by their feeling and emotion. And when they're asked, why did you do that? The common answer is because I felt like it. Feeling is, you know, you can't be a Christian that is based on feelings. Your, 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 your faith should be best. Your faith should be based on the knowledge of the Lord of Jesus Christ and his gospel and what he has done on the cross for you. It is not a feeling because feelings come and go, right? Feelings can come today and feel different feelings can be tomorrow. Feelings is not where your salvation is based on, but it is based on the word of God and not in anything else. All right, let's move on because I need to finish this very soon. Oh God, time is... All right, so next is emotional. Okay, let's continue with, uh, with uh, all this. So, all right, so there's the other, the other, this something called coldness. People grow cold in their faith, right? Um, that's that's one thing. People may grow cold, but we have to keep the you know flame, the fire all the time. We have to come and and uh, and it cannot be cold. And tolerance. All right. Let me just touch on it. There are some things that that are tolerated in the church. See, when you see a rattlesnake, okay, when you see a rattlesnake, you may see a rattlesnake in your backyard. Uh, what do you do with the rattlesnake? Did you just leave it over there? No, you would take the rattlesnake and like, like what Cedric did the other day, would take the snake and keep as far as distance as he can with the rattlesnake, right? But if you leave the rattlesnake in your back and what will happen? One day the rattlesnake will bite you, correct? There'll be poison, there'll be something. And so if, if, if there is a problem, you got to take care of it, okay? Suppose in my body, I have cancer. Doctor looked at it, there's a cancer. Would I just tolerate the cancer and let it stay there? Or would I do something about it so that it doesn't grow, it just kills it? So that's what we need. When we see in a church there's something happening which is not right, we cannot tolerate it. And as brothers and sisters, we cannot tolerate that because if that happens, you know, there's a, there's a saying which says, one bad apple can destroy the entire batch. And that's why God has placed elders and pastors over seers over the people of God so that they may take care of the sheep. All right, let's continue. We'll, 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 we'll talk about this last one. There's enemies of the church, but there is one time coming when the church will be glorified. All right, so these are some of the verses. And those who he predestined, he also called. And those he also called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. The church will go through a lot of struggle. The church will go through a lot of persecution. Many people have sang hymns and have gone and, 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 uh, and gave up themselves as martyrs for the church. People who, people were crucified, people were sawed into half. People were thrown into boiling oil. People were killed because of being a follower of Jesus Christ. But one day, this church will be glorified. This world is against Christians. This world is against Christ. Bible says Jesus Christ came to his own, but his own did not receive him. When Jesus Christ came into this world, there was not a place to lay his head. He had to find a manger to be born. So from the beginning, Christ was not accepted. If Christ was not accepted, the church will not be accepted by this world. And so it is another reason why brothers and church have to dwell together, encouraging each other. So the church will be glorified. You'll go through the struggles, but one day the Lord Jesus will come and a rapture will happen and we shall all be caught up in heaven and we shall 
be like him. Hallelujah. When Christ is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Praise God for this glorious promise that we have. We can go through struggles. We can go through problems. But God gives us grace to go through this problem because one day we shall be with the Lord and we shall worship the Lord. So struggles in this world is nothing. Struggles in this world can come. Praise be to God. Our reward in heaven will be even more. Verse says over here, but our citizenship is in heaven. So what does it mean? You are not a citizenship of citizen of this world. We are looking for a heaven and a, 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 a heaven to come where we shall be with our Lord and Savior. For it was, if it, okay, so what our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject to all things to himself. So we will have a glorious body. The church will have a glorious body. Yes, we may have ailments, we may have suffering, we may have many problems in this world, but all this is going to go, it's all temporary. We shall be with our God in heaven. And to conclude, the last verse says, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also may be glorified with him. Jesus Christ suffered and then he was glorified. The church will have to go through suffering and then it will be glorified one day. Dear brothers and sisters, one hour, almost one hour, 25 minutes, we were able to cover these 10 points. What is church? The visible and the invisible church. The foundation of the church. Names given to churches. Who builds a church? We know Jesus builds the church. The mission of the church, the governing structure, roles and responsibility of the church members, the enemies of the church, and the church glorified. We look forward for the glorified church where we all shall be with God. Face to face, we'll be rejoicing. Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I have kept the faith and I have finished the race. Now in store for me is a crown of righteousness. And not only for me, but to all those who are longing for his appearing. Church, eternal life church. If you are longing for his appearing, if you are living a life, faithful, committed life in relationship to Christ and God's people, there awaits you a glorified end. And we look forward for that glorified end. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. And that is about the church. Now, brothers and sisters, a couple of minutes, if you have any questions, we can ask. Otherwise, Brother George is going to pray and conclude. Any questions, brothers? As I said, I will give you a chance, but we don't have much time, only a couple of minutes. No questions. I explained it so well, huh? <laughs> Any questions? No? It's all right. Okay. All right. So probably pastor will come back probably but surely pastor will come back next friday and we'll continue in our study of the book of revelation so brother george would you close in prayer please thank you thank you brother jason for this bible study it was uh, great to hear something different from the revelation after a long revelation chapter learning this was a good break for us and really encouraging knowing uh, about church and all the things surrounding the church it, it was a, a ton of knowledge it was a lot of things which i never knew and it was really great for us to learn this together uh, let's uh, look unto our lord and uh, once again uh, bring our prayers and supplication unto him and give thanks to him for this time that he has given us let's all close our eyes and 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 and, and meditate and 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 uh, bring together our prayers, our praises unto the Lord, like uh, our, 